In America today, we produce more food than ever before. So you might think that we have less reason to worry about food now than at any time in history. And yet many people in the United States and elsewhere are increasingly concerned about how our food is grown. We worry about whether farmers are using chemicals like insecticides and herbicides. And most recently, people have voiced concern about genetically modified food. Critics have accused scientists who genetically modify plants of playing God and dangerously tampering with the natural order. We are messing around with nature. And after all, we all depend on the planet and its survival for our survival. But scientists say genetic engineering represents a huge leap forward in our understanding of the living world that it will lead to many improvements in agriculture and bring enormous benefits to all of us. And they argue that genetic engineering is only an extension of what man has been doing with crops for the past 10,000 years. Historians will look back on this as a critical moment in history when we change the human food supply. Using modern methods of agriculture combined with genetic engineering, we'll be able to create plants that are the superfoods of tomorrow. So who's right? And what do science and history tell us about the food we eat? Welcome to California, where the race is on to look good and live longer. It's extraordinary how ingenious people here are at finding artificial ways of looking naturally healthy and beautiful. As I walk around my hometown of Los Angeles, I'm struck by how many things around us are man-made. Cars, computers, rollerblades, bicycles, and we don't hesitate to put man-made things in our bodies, fillings in our teeth, pacemakers in our heart, implants to make us look beautiful. But if there's one thing we demand to be just as nature intended, it's our food. Today, we are much more conscious of the need to eat healthily. And for many people, eating healthily means eating naturally. These days, more and more health food shops and restaurants are opening up, offering food which they say is just how nature intended. Among these are Ann Gentry's vegetarian restaurants in L.A. You know, we're blessed. I mean, I'm living in California. This is certainly the mecca of the natural foods movement, organic farming. We're showing people that, hey, you can eat differently, you can eat simply, you can eat this stuff I keep referring to as peasant food. It can taste good, look good, be good, and be good for you. And you have a sense that people are getting fearful of tampering with their food. I think people are standing up and going, no, I, I, I want to feel at least one thing in my life, that food can be grown really the way God intended it to be grown. Pretty simple, pretty clean, not tampered with. But how natural is anything that we eat? I happen to share Anne's curiosity about food. Despite having worked in plant genetics for many years, there's still a lot that I don't know. So I've decided to set out on a journey to find out more about the nature of food and where food comes from. And to do this, I want to start at the beginning with the origins of agriculture itself. I've come to Mexico, where many thousands of years ago, our American hunter-gatherer ancestors first learned how to grow their own food. One of the most important crops that we use today is corn, which we find in everything from fizzy drinks to tortilla chips. And in fact, corn was one of the first crops to be grown in the Americas. But soon I discover a remarkable fact. The corn we know today is very unlike the corn grown by our ancestors, and their corn too was unlike anything to be found in nature. According to agricultural historian Professor Garcia Barcena, the plant from which corn was derived had cobs which were too small to be useful and therefore had to be modified by the earliest American farmers. Let me make sure I understand what you're saying, that corn wasn't made by nature, it was really made by 
early man 10,000 years ago. Sure it is because uh, the, well, the original corn has caused about uh, one inch long at most, and uh, very small seeds are across of them. And uh, well, it's not a very attractive plant as a uh, cultivated one. It had to be very highly modified to be useful. So if corn hasn't always looked like it does today, what did it look like before? And how did these early farmers manage to alter its natural characteristics? To find out more, I decided to visit the International Crop Research Institute just outside Mexico City. Plant scientists Julian Berto and Brent Scoveman have promised to show me the primitive plant from which our corn is derived. Look, this is there's the primitive ear of corn. Looks utterly useless. Yeah, this is almost, uh, it's, let's say, it's an uh, ancestor of corn. It's called uh, here in Mexico, Teocintli. So this couldn't be eaten as a food at all? It could have been some time ago, because if you put it on a fire, in a fireplace, it will pop, just like a popcorn. But it's not very productive, though. No, especially it's very difficult to harvest it, because we have to uh, pick every uh, seed uh, by hand and one by one. So the domestication involved going from this small little cob-like structure yeah. in which the seeds just fell out to something very large like this. Exactly. And even larger this like large this. Corn. So the corn cob that I eat was made by man and not by nature. Not by nature, just by man. So how did this happen? In any crop, farmers have always found that there are one or two plants that are different. This is simply because of natural genetic mutation or the accidental crossing of different plant strains. But occasionally, these new plants have traits which are useful, so farmers would come across corn plants, for example, with large cobs, or cobs which didn't drop their seeds, or cobs with fewer toxic compounds used in nature to fight off insects and other pests. Left to nature, many of these novel varieties would simply die out. But farmers have intervened to protect the plants they like and encourage more of them to grow. In this way, by breaking the laws of natural selection, farmers have managed to create new plants to better suit our needs. Look at these pumpkins. Look at the variety in shapes, in colors. All of this is due to natural mutations, just changing the plant. And what man did 10,000 years ago was to be able to use this variety of genetic information to select from the small corn to the larger corn, to select from this small gourd to this huge pumpkin that I can hardly pick up. These things are related to each other. They're identical, but look at the differences in the size, simply due to one or a few genes. And this is really genetics at work, and this is what man has been able to do. Agricultural historians say that even wheat has not always existed, but was rather the result of two strains of wild grass, accidentally crossbreeding and then being selected by primitive farmers. So this has genes from different species combined into one nucleus, into one plant. This has genes from different species in one plant. And those... And this was accidental by nature, but then it was selected by man because you had to select for the good characters to domesticate this wheat. And I say man, I should probably say woman, because I'm almost 100% sure that it was the woman, the women that domesticated the plant species. Strange as it may seem, it was this process of primitive genetic modification which has created the fruits and vegetables that we use today. They didn't have broccoli, they didn't have Brussels sprouts, uh, they really didn't have wheat, they certainly didn't have corn, they didn't have soybean, they didn't have tomatoes. Nearly all of the things that we see in our shops today and we enjoy were not there provided by nature. They've really been developed by uh, genetics and selection by man, uh, constantly intervening and selecting to serve his purposes. <laughs> 